Madison Grand Rounds. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Stanley Cohen. Dr. Cohen graduated Alpha Omega Alpha from the University of Southern California School of Medicine in Los Angeles. He subsequently completed his internship in resident and residency in internal medicine at UCSD and his fellowships in both gastroenterology and hepatology at Cedar sinai and University of Southern California, respectively. He then stayed on as assistant clinical professor of medicine at UCLA prior to moving to the Midwest, where he continued to rise in academic medicine to eventually serve as the Richard B. Capps Endowed Chair Professor of Hepatology at Rush University Medical Center from 2006 to 2009. Dr. Cohen joined as Medical Director of Hepatology at Case Western Reserve University in 2012 and also serves as the Fellowship Director in Transplant Hepatology. In addition to providing outstanding clinical care, Dr. Cohen serves on the Educational Affairs Committee of the American College of Gastroenterology. Dr. Cohen has been involved in over 25 major clinical trials and has published over 30 peer review articles. Please welcome Dr. Stanley Cohen, who will be speaking about new hepatitis C therapies. Hello there, thanks for the opportunity. Don't ask why I went from Los Angeles to Cleveland, long story, but it could have been Detroit. So, um, so these are my disclosures. And we're going to do a general overview of hepatitis C today. Hopefully I don't lose my voice here. The big changes in hepatitis C have been therapy. And we could literally spend the next 10 hours talking about all the new therapies. My goal for a general grand rounds is to give you a little bit more of a general overview. And we'll talk a little bit about therapy. I'm going to throw a lot of ugly looking slides at you of graphs and charts talking about the new therapies. My goal is not for anybody to memorize this, but just to give you an idea of kind of where we've been, where we're at, and where we're going. And just to kind of give you an idea of what has changed change so dramatically about this topic. So the slides I'm going to show you are going to quote all different types of numbers, and again, it just depends on the source. But roughly you hear the magic 4 million people in the United States with hepatitis C. And when you look at this, that's probably a gross underrepresentation. Ironically, when you look at the NHANES data, that does not include the homeless, veterans, or prisoners. So if you think about who's going to actually have hepatitis C, it's going to be the homeless, the veterans, the prisoners. So the estimate is that there might be as many as 7 million people in the U.S. with hepatitis C. Now, very important is the idea of do they know about it? Because if they don't know about it, then it's relatively useless to us. So this is an embarrassing slide, but here, using an estimate of the 4 million people who have hep C, 38% are diagnosed, or 1.6 million, 5% are treated, 89,000. So again, if I tell you nothing at all, all I want to do is tell you to get these people screened and get them into uh, the opportunity for therapy, which we'll come back to. Now, there are many barriers here. And so, first thing is hepatitis C. Next thing is diagnosing them, getting them to the right place, and then getting treatment started. As you see here, there's a lot of different problems. Now, hepatitis C only occurs in bad people, so there's a stigma. You don't want to be diagnosed with it. Well, in reality, that's not true. And so that is a huge hurdle because there's still the feeling that it only occurs in IV drug abusers. It only occurs in people who did this to themselves. I'll show you the risk factors here in a few minutes, and we'll see that's not true. Well, once they get diagnosed, they still have to get to the right people. I don't think that hepatologists have to treat hepatitis, especially uh, with these new drugs that are coming out. I think it's the best way to do it, but the point is ID can do it. Some primary care docs may end up doing it. The point is they need to get to somebody who knows what they're doing about hepatitis and treat it. And so again, a lot of different hurdles that we have to get through. Now, in terms of the United States, you're going to see, again, all kinds of numbers. The rough estimate is about 1.5 or 1.6% U.S. population has hepatitis C. But if you look here, what you'll find is a little bit different depending on who you're talking to or talking about. 
If you looked at African American males around age 40 in big cities, the estimate is as high as 10% have hepatitis C. So again, you need to be careful when you read an article and you're looking at uh, Caucasian housewives in Beverly Hills compared to an inner city population. It's going to be important for the demographics, but it's also going to be important to talk about treatment, genotypes, etc., which we'll come back to. Now again, we've talked about this concept, which is the idea that we just don't screen well and patients don't know about it. There's a lot of reasons for this, and I'll show you some of it, but really what it comes down to is, I did something 30 years ago, I feel fine, why should I be tested? My physician may have the same opinion and may have normal liver tests, thus I have no reason to even think about being screened. The point is that no one wanted to get screened for HIV because it was a guaranteed death sentence. Well, as time went on and therapies got better, you'll see here that the far majority, sorry, didn't show up real well, but only about 20% are unaware of their infection. However, in hep C, you're talking about 75%. These are the sources of infection. This is an old slide, but it hasn't changed, so I haven't updated it. But still, injection drug use is the major. But if you notice there, there's a 10%, which we have no idea what it is. There's a sexual, there's tra uh, blood transfusions, etc. This slide is of absolutely no importance to me in terms of really trying to delve into this. So uh, with Keith sitting here, Keith can tell us all about when HIV first came out, and we thought that IV drug abusers got a different type of HIV than homosexuals. We thought one got Kaposi's, one got PCP. We had to know the difference. Same principle in hepatitis C. We thought there was a difference in really knowing where it came from. At this point, we know that's all bogus. Now, if I have an executive sitting in my office and I keep pounding him about IV drug abuse in the 60s, who cares? He has hep C right here, right now. Let's move on. So again, this is for education, but and you're going to lose your patient's uh, faith and confidence if you spend too much time here. Having said that, there is a small risk of sexual spread. There is a small risk of household blood-to-blood -blood contact, razor blades, toothbrushes, etc. So again, I don't really search on the index case of where they got it from, but I do look into risk factors of spreading it. Now, in terms of these are our overall risk factors, let's go a little bit more quantitative here. And what you'll find are some numbers here that if you look across the board at intravenous drug users, you have about a 60-ish percent chance of having hep C. This is in no way, shape, or form true in a big metro area. We're much closer to 80, 90 plus percent. If you go to a methadone clinic in LA, New York, San Francisco, presumably Cleveland, Detroit, you're going to find 90-ish percent hep C. If you're ever in search of hep C subjects for a study, go to a methadone clinic. But also what you'll find here is that HIV increases your risk, presumably from uh, similar risk factors, and then with number of sexual partners, we see an increase. So again, in terms of counseling, very standard things we recommend, these are probably not ridiculously high risk. This is not, oh, I shared the razor blade of my partner, I'm going to have it. But the point is, in theory, a drop of blood could be spread from one to the other. So don't share razor blades, don't share toothbrushes, obviously don't share injection syringes. I'm not going to get into needle sharing and all that. It's not the purpose of this. Um, in terms of blood donation, obviously forbidden organ donation uh, not accepted risk of sexual spread very common question we get the uh, current guideline is less than 5% lifelong partner what we recommend is the partner get tested if they're negative then they can make a decision condoms probably bring the risk down closer to zero but if a couple's been together 40 years and they haven't picked it up yet probably doesn't make much sense to change it. But the key is, it's a couple by couple decision. Now, I take this one step further. 
I recommend screening family members and household contacts. That is not in the guidelines, but my thought is that uh, if you have kids around the house, and who knows if they picked up your razor blade, your toothbrush, whatever. So I do recommend a one-time screening. Again, no one from the health department is going to knock on these people's doors. It's just something to think about. Now, in terms of alcohol, again, these are what the guidelines state. I'm a liver doctor, so to me, the answer is absolutely zero alcohol. One of the reasons is if I tell them one a day is fine, they hear five. If I tell them three, you know, et cetera, we've all played that game. So my thought is if I tell them none and they drink one or two here and there, it's probably not a big deal. Hepatitis A and B vaccines, again, just a knee-jerk response. When I have a positive hep C, I make sure I check HAV, HBV, HCV, and HIV. Again, all those need to be checked at some point. Vaccinate them against A and B if they're negative. Now, don't, don't pay attention to this slide. I'll show you why in a second. But these are the AASLD. This is our big uh, society's recommendations for screening. No surprise, based on the risk factors, uh, parents who had hep C, uh, organ donation, or organ acceptance prior to 1991, blood transfusion before 1991, et cetera, et cetera. Let's make this simple. And let's get rid of this. And the reason, as I said, is that a lot of times your executive your physician, your nurse, whoever, doesn't really want to tell you what they might have been doing in the 60s and 70s. So let's see where we're going with these new recommendations. This is a totally useless, ridiculous study, but it brought up a really good point, so I put it here. You'll notice there's no reference because it's actually from a drug company. And what they did was they surveyed 100 people and they asked them in the waiting area about why they were screened for hepatitis C. And take a look there. It's pretty embarrassing. And healthcare worker asked about risk factors 5% of the time. So again, not only are the patients maybe hesitant to tell us, we're bad at asking the question. Number two issue here is that if you looked at all the patients with hepatitis C, it kind of clumps right around the baby boomers. Depending on what study you look at, 60 to 85 percent of them will actually be in this baby boomer era. So the new guideline is this. Let's get rid of risk-based screening and switch over to birth cohort screening. That way we don't need to embarrass anybody. We don't need to go through all these different risk factors. We can just say that you were born between 1945 and 1965, get tested one time. This is not absolute. If you have somebody that maybe was screened but now has new risk factors, if you have somebody younger or older with risk factors, if you have someone who was screened 20 years ago but you're still concerned, by all means do it. This is the minimum that we want to do, and this is getting paid for. So, is this happening? So, uh, I don't think Brandon's here in the audience today, but Brandon uh, did a study with us looking to see how patients were doing in terms of being screened. He used the Douglas Moore Clinic, and what we did was this is a three-part study. Three-month retrospective chart review, followed by an educational uh, intensive session or sessions, followed by the exact same study repeated after education. So, 22% of the uh, healthcare providers, this is interns, residents, uh, NPs, PAs, attendings, this is everybody there. Only 22% said they actually screened according to the CDC guidelines. I'm not quite sure how 22% translates into 1.1%, but that's how many actually were really doing it. And so what we had was there were 200 brand new patients to the system that we looked at for that three month period in the right age range. And you'll find that six of them were screened, but of those, four of them had risk factors, so they're kind of the old risk-based screening. So all the ones that had no risk factors, 1.1% were screened. So even in our own institution, we're guilty of this. Again, we're in the process right now of doing, a, we're about halfway through the second, third month collection after uh, going through a series of uh, educational seminars, rounds, emails, etc. We'll see how we do. Now, why aren't people being screened? Really, it's a kind of 50-50-ish that they weren't aware of the CDC guidelines or they just didn't have time or 
they just didn't have any evidence of liver disease. So part of what some places are doing across the country is doing EMR reminders. Uh, some systems like Epic allow you to actually put up reminders in, a, in an opening screen that you actually have to clear before you can go on to the next thing, be that flu shot, colonoscopy, hep C screening, whatever. So you're going to see a few of these white and blue slides. This is from our most recent uh, Liver Society meeting that we just had uh, about three weeks ago. So these are all brand new slides. So screening is terrible. Everybody acknowledges it. We all know it. People are not being screened. So this particular group decided to try and do something about it. They took a look at three different strategies. Strategy number one was to send the uh, patients a letter. And the letter basically said, you're in the age range 1945, 1965, come in and get screened. And what you find here, and sorry, the pointer's not great, 27% of them got screened versus 1.5% of those people that didn't get the letter. Number two was a provider alert. This was generally emails, EMR, reminders, etc. You got up to 31% versus 3.5%. And then finally, I don't quite know about the HIPAA and everything else on this one. This was actually a recruiter in the waiting room. What's your birth date? When were you born? And telling them to get screened. Again, I think that's maybe a little bit over the top, but the point is you see that they got up to 60% of the patients being screened. So I think the long-winded answer to this is, I don't care how we do it, we just have to screen them. Now, why screen them? The therapies are terrible, they make you sick as a dog, they don't work, etc. I'm going to show you that's very different now, and we're going to be at the point where we can almost cure every hep C patient with minimal side effects. So again, hard to argue this 15 years ago when my therapy was so bad, why know about people who can't help, but it's really changed, and again, I'll show you that. So in terms of labs, there are essentially five labs. And again, there's a few more that I've kind of cut off here. And one of them I'm going to cut off is going to be this Hep C uh, by Reba. In essence, the equivalent of this is the Western blot HIV. It's just not available. The assay is not available. So we have our screening antibody, which is just our standard test. And then we have our quantitative Hep C RNA. There is a qualitative. No one's really going to use it. Quantitative is so good nowadays you don't need it. And then there's genotype and then there's some assessment of the state of the liver and I'll come back to that in a second. In terms of genotypes, remember I said before, be very careful when you read an article that you know what they're talking about. Because if I tell you that I cured 100% of hep C genotype 2 patients by using water bottles, then anybody can cure genotype 2. If I tell you I did the same thing with genotype 1, that's a very different beast. So we need to be able to pay attention to this, and I'll show you this in a few minutes. <laughs> Most common in our country, genotype 1. If you're looking at an inner city African American population, probably over 90%. Genotype 2, very easy to treat, but not very common in this country. And then genotype 3, even less common. We see very little 4, 5, and 6. Again, depends where you're from. If the article is coming out of Egypt, it's going to be all genotype 4s. So again, keep an eye on where the article is, where it's coming from, and what the genotypes are. Now, in terms of the last one I said, which was kind of getting an idea of the grade and stage of the hepatitis, this is the class one level A recommendation from our society that an assessment of the amount of fibrosis needs to be done. Now, that does not mean we need to do liver biopsies, and I'll show you that. Now, for those who are younger in the audience, you may rely on textbooks and you may rely on guidelines. They are relatively and almost completely useless in that they don't change. So in other words, when I have written guidelines, I generally write them in May. They might get uh, published somewhere September, October, November, December. And if it's a rapidly changing field, 
they're useless. And so now we get to wait another year or two, and if it's a textbook, it's even worse. So what our society did, and again, it's kind of small here, but this is actually a living and breathing guideline. This is an online guideline that's continuously updated. And it's actually, I think, going to become the standard. And I think most societies have already started this or are doing it. But the point is that if you're looking at the hep C guidelines, be it diagnosis, treatment, whatever, there will be nothing outdated. It will be updated roughly every month. And that way, as new medicines come in, we'll be able to update it. I mean, imagine in the HIV world, five, 10 years years ago when there were 20 new drugs coming out a month, again, your guideline was useless the minute it was published. So the point is we have a guideline that can really help you out. Now, why do we need to know about the stage of liver disease? If I can cure everybody, just cure everybody and move onward. Keep in mind, I may be able to cure the hepatitis. That doesn't mean that I can cure the underlying liver condition. So in other words, if somebody has cirrhosis, there's no guarantee they're going back to a normal liver. I still assume they have cirrhosis. So there's two big implications of cirrhosis. Number one are varices. So I need to know about whether they have cirrhosis or not. And you can see the numbers here. But basically, half of your cirrhotics get varices, a, a decent percent of them will bleed, high mortality, etc. And more importantly, there's effective therapies. So the point is, I want to know about cirrhosis for variceal risk. Number two is going to be this one. This is the classic case that we're expecting to see a lot of, which is hep C cirrhotic patients who get cured of their hepatitis are now totally ignored. And five years later, we see this nice beast of a tumor. And we're going to see this comment. You, you said I was cured. And I think this is going to be a problem. So again, we need to have an idea if they have cirrhosis here. In addition, as I'm going to show you on the guidelines, cirrhosis will actually tell us how long you're going to be treated for, depending on what drug. It might be 12 weeks, it might be 24 if you have cirrhosis. And so it's going to be very important. Now, the obvious simple answer is biopsy everybody. And biopsy is fantastic because it tells me the grade and stage of the liver. It tells me if there's anything else going on. Come on, are you really drinking? Uh, is there Hep B? Is there Wilson's? You know, et cetera. But the point is that it isn't quite so simple and easy. And if you look here, you find that about a quarter of people will have some significant degree of pain. Uh, bleeding is somewhere in, in terms of severe as in bleed to death, one in 10,000. That is not high, but that's not also zero. And so you know, we really have to respect liver biopsy. Also, liver biopsy is somewhere between three and $4,000. I'm talking from the second they walk in until they actually have their follow-up visit with the path report in hand. So that's not an inconsequential amount of money. So there have been a lot of modalities looked at and developed to actually try and give us an idea. Because really, if you think about it from what we said, all we really care about is cirrhosis or no cirrhosis. That's really all we're asking. And so there are many blood tests, the FibroSure, the FibroSpec, the APRI, etc. There's also an ultrasound-based technology, which we will supposedly be getting in January here, called the FibroScan machine, which actually can uh, tell us the stage of fibrosis and may truly be the end of liver biopsy and hepatitis C. Now, do these things uh, hold up? And the answer is yes. And I just showed you one which is a blood test and one which is this ultrasound-based fibroscan. And what you find here in the light green yellow, these are the people with the earliest disease. And it doesn't matter if it's a blood test on top or the fibroscan below, but complications, low. Liver cancer, very low. Survival is essentially 100%. As their stage gets worse, which is going to be down here, you find that all their complications go up. So so the point is that if we were to put these non-invasive blood tests next to an ultrasound, next to a liver biopsy, they all correlate. So in other words, if I have a fibro scan in a month and I can tell this person that they have cirrhosis or don't, I'm pretty comfortable with that diagnosis. I don't need to do a biopsy. The role of the biopsy is going to be for the person who maybe does have two or three illnesses going on, alcohol, fatty liver, and hep C. 
or these tests don't make sense. So some these are not perfect tests. They're 80 plus percent accurate. But the point is, if you have one or two of these tests not agreeing, then maybe you tie break with the biopsy. But the far majority of biopsies can be avoided here. So what's the natural history of hepatitis C? And so we always talk about this magic 15 to 30 percent that cure themselves. Now again, keep in mind, the hep C antibody positive forever, the RNA negative forever. You don't know that the first time you see them, so you usually have to follow them for a while. It's amazing how many of these patients get sent back to us every few years because someone does a hep C antibody and says, oh, you're hep C, we need, you need to get treated for it. So again, the antibody will be positive forever. Now, the majority go on to chronic hepatitis and only a minority go on to cirrhosis. And notice this is over many decades. The problem is, unless I have serial biopsies or serial fibro scans, whatever, I don't know who's going to go on to nothing and who's going to go on to significant liver disease. So you can either follow them serially or you can kind of treat everybody. With the new therapies, we're probably going to err on the latter side. Now, it takes decades to get there, but once you are cirrhotic, this is annual rate, roughly 5-ish percent per year will develop cancer, decompensate, or die. So the point is, if we go back here, all of our goals of therapy are to intervene right here. Because again, once you get cirrhosis, all the badness occurs. In terms of the impact, number one indication for liver transplant. That will change in the next five years. But again, number one reason for transplant, number one reason in the United States for liver cancer, and we talked about the death risk. This is one that surprises a lot of people. And what you'll find here is that somewhere around 2006, 2007, mortality from hep C went above mortality from HIV. It's not that HIV got wimpier and hep C got nastier. It really comes down to therapies. And so I think what you're going to find is as the hep C therapies get better, you're going to see this number drop. Now, in terms of mortality, hepatitis C obviously causes liver badness. No surprise, we all know that. But I'll show you that there's more badness that occurs that we wouldn't normally think of. So these are hep C RNA positive patients, all cause mortality higher than those that don't have active hep C. No surprise. Liver disease, but what's interesting here, extrahepatic diseases are even higher. Not something we normally think about. When we take a look here, this is relative risk of death from thyroid, seven times higher, prostate, six times, esophagus, six times. Now granted, some of these people are drinkers, smokers, etc., but the point is hep C can have relationships to other types of uh, morbidity and mortality. Now I'm not saying that curing hep C will drop these all down to zero. I think the cofactors are going to probably still play into it. But whatever component of this is hepatitis C, we're going to see that drop down the road. Now the extra hepatic manifestations, again, we see hep C patients referred to us from very odd sources. We never saw dermatology patients being referred to us, opto patients. But it's not a surprise that we are seeing a lot more of them because those specialists are attuned to it. I highlighted a couple ones. Cryoglobulinemia is hep C until proven otherwise, period. Porphyria containing a tarda, and I wish I should have brought a picture. I saw a patient yesterday who actually was diagnosed with it on the internet because he's been going to his uh, doctor for the last six months with these nasty blisters on his hand and no one's been able to figure it out. All they know is he has hep C and it was embarrassing that he went to WebMD and found it himself. But anyway, same principle here. PCT is hep C until proven otherwise. Lichen planus, not as strong, but on the other hand, the dermatologists and even ENT is sending us some of these patients. Now, what about the goals of therapy? Again, you can't cure a virus. I mean, Keith takes care of HIV. He doesn't cure it. He controls it. I take care of Hep B. I don't cure it. I control it. Hepatitis C is different. This is a curable disease. Again, not necessarily the underlying liver fibrosis component, but the actual uh, virus. Now, what is this SVR, or sustained virologic response? Treat them with whatever, stop, 
wait six months. So six months off therapy, if your virus, negative, virus load is zero, you are considered an SVR cured. That is the so-called SVR 24, 24 weeks out. The FDA now recognizes SVR 12 as being equivalent. Now, having said that, I'm still an old timer. I do the 12 weeks and the 24 weeks out. But the point is, if you're negative here, you are considered cured of your infection. What does that mean? Well, 99 plus percent of people remain that way, so it is durable. And more importantly, there's improvement in all the clinical parameters of the hepatitis. So let's look at a new study here. This one, again, just came out a couple weeks ago. In red are the people that did not, I'm sorry, in red are the people that did get cured, the SVRs, and in the teal here are the ones that did not. And it doesn't matter what you look at. All-cause mortality drops significantly, risk of liver cancer drops significantly, and the need for transplant dropped to a nil in this study. And again, it didn't matter if these were average hep C, just cirrhotics, or hep C HIV co-infected. And again, you see 60 to 90% reduction in these bad outcomes. So the point is this SVR is going to be uh, very important for us. Now, again, don't, don't waste your time looking at this, and I'll show you why. So in the old days, when I used to treat a patient, I'd sit him down, okay, you're a male, that drops you a couple points, you're African American, that drops you a couple points, you're a female, it goes up a couple points, you're Asian, a couple points. We used to play these balancing games. We'd almost literally go through a grid of all these factors that would tell us if you're going to respond to therapy or not. Because old-fashioned interferon was such a nasty medicine, if after going through this grid, I could tell you had a 7 or 8 or 10% chance of cure, you probably didn't want to go through it. On the other hand, if you were a thin Asian female, etc., maybe it was 70%, you may want to go through it. So let's actually go into the modern world and do that. We're going to get rid of this. This, in essence, doesn't matter to us much anymore. Well, then somebody came up with genetics, and let's look at uh, IL-28B polymorphisms. Different ones respond differently, blah, blah, blah gone. So again, the point is that all of these things that we looked at to predict who would respond are all gone. And now you're seeing why we're talking about essentially considering treating everybody with hep C. I'll show you how unimportant all these factors are. So let's go back to a little history lesson here. This is the interferon era, if you will. And this is the new so-called DAAs, direct acting antivirals. These are all the oral agents. All those factors that I just showed you were absolutely essential in the era of interferon. We had to go through all those. Look at these horrible numbers. Well, they weren't so horrible when you consider the fact that it was 16% versus nothing if we didn't do anything. But the point is, as time has gone on, our numbers have gotten better. Why is that? Well, because hepatologists are brilliant and geniuses. We've done a great job. No. Hepatologists have actually been smart enough to follow the HIV docs and learn all the techniques and all the advances from HIV. We've moved much faster than the HIV docs because we've literally copied so much of what they've done, which is why you'll see that uh, the time course for Hep C has sped up so quickly. So to my ID colleagues, thank you. And so again, what we've done is we've done that same exact idea. So we have no clue how interferon gets rid of hep C. It's actually, if you will, almost a side effect of interferon to cure hep C. And the problem is the other side effects are all the bad things that we see, the aches, pains, fevers, chills, etc. Well, that's a pretty lousy way to treat a virus. And if you think about it, that's why you're seeing these horrible numbers. So along the lines of HIV, why not attack the virus directly? Why not prevent it from entering a cell? Why not kill it off? Why not prevent its replication, etc.? And you're seeing the same principle now in hep C therapy, direct acting antivirals. That's exactly what it means, hitting multiple steps along the way. Now we could spend hours, as I said, talking about this, but I put this up just like your HIV drugs, just to show you that you may use one from column A and one from column B, et cetera. And again, we're gonna use proteases, we're gonna use polymerases, and there's gonna be all different characteristics. Some have good resistance, some have bad resistance, but the point is in combination, you'll overcome the weaknesses of some of the drugs with the strengths of the others. Now there are currently 
five DAAs that are approved. And I put an underline here because these still involve interferon and ribavirin. Those are kind of, we, we all have bad memories of these. So these are not the ones that we're really going to use very often. So when you come down here, these are the two new ones. You see October and November. And there's going to be one approved in the next one to two weeks, which will be AbbVie products. I do not know what they're even going to be called. They have not named them completely. And this is that guideline. And I put up here a comment here, which is, this is my guess. That once the new AbbVie drugs are approved in the next one to three weeks, this is going to get re-updated. But this is what I'm going to estimate it's going to be. You're going to actually have three groups of therapy for genotype 1. Sofosbuvir, Ladipasvir, either 8, 12, or 24 weeks, depending on who you are. Remember I said it's important to know about cirrhosis, whether you failed treatment before, etc. Second group is Semeprovir, Sofosbuvir. And you see here, cirrhosis doubles the amount of therapy you're on. That's why it's important to know about it. Not that I make a penny off of it. $154,000 for that therapy, $308,000 for that therapy. So it's kind of important to know if they have cirrhosis or not. And then, again, I don't even know what they're going to be calling them. Their nickname is 3D and 3D ribavirin. Those are the AbbVie products. Genotype 2, pretty straightforward. Everybody gets sofosbuvir ribavirin 12 weeks. Genotype 3, same thing with 24 weeks. Genotypes 4 and 6, which you literally may never see a case in your average practice. Now, because of the cost of these drugs and the fact that there are not enough treaters to treat three, four, five, seven million people, there has been a priority system put into place. And what you will find is the priority system is that essentially the people with very advanced liver disease and or less disease but with kidney disease and then kind of the middle of the road people, which is moderate hep hepatitis with other things that could impact it, alcohol, NASH, fatty liver, etc. And what you'll find is that about 40% of patients are not in this higher priority group. So for those of you that are getting any of my uh, dictations, you may see at the bottom, we've ordered the drugs for the patient, the patients are where there's a good chance they will not get them yet. That's based on this priority and cost. They'll get them in a few months. Once the costs come down, I'm not concerned. Now, why is it important to treat these people? Well, one of the things that we want to do is prevent progression of the disease. And I just put this one up here to give you an idea of the cost. So even though these drugs cost a lot of money, they're going to save a lot of money ultimately. This is cost of somebody with non-serotic liver disease. This is uh, per cost per, per month per patient. If they get cirrhosis in the yellow here, but if they actually get all the way to be compensated in stage liver disease, you see a huge jump there. So again, my goal is not to sit here and talk about the cost and benefit of therapy and societal obligations and insurance company. But the point is, these are expensive drugs, but there are some reasons to try and get them treated. So as I said before, this is where I started. And um, we had tons of side effects with the interferon. And so we're not going to talk about those anymore. This is where we're at right now. So again, the maximum I got with standard interferon ribavirin, 40-ish percent for genotype 1. Here we are with uh, one of the new medications, the sofosbuvir, the diposphere. Not too shabby there. That's 12 weeks, one pill a day, period. Notice that we don't need ribavirin, there's no difference. And it did not matter here whether they had no cirrhosis or cirrhosis. You're not going to necessarily get these numbers in your real life practice. You know, there's going to be different issues that come up. But the point is, these are the kinds of numbers. And now you get an idea from when I started this talk of why we're really excited about the concept of trying to treat almost everybody. Now, there are some other groups here, and again, this is a bit of apples to oranges, so one study might say 93, one might say 99. The point is these are different studies, but I, I've been quoting people more than 90%. I'm not necessarily going to quote them 100% because nothing's 100%. If they have a low viral load and they're not cirrhotic, we can get away with eight weeks of therapy, 97% cure rates. So the point is, you now see why we have sort of an eight week, a 12 week, and then the treatment experience cirrhotics here. This group needs 24 weeks because if we only treat them for 12 weeks, 
we actually don't get as good of a response as if we skip, treat them for 24 weeks. This is the other one that was just approved actually about three weeks ago, semeprovir, sofosbuvir, a protease inhibitor, as well as an NS5B. And what you'll find here is cure rates again, well north of 90%. And again, I'm not gonna try and compare. The way that this one got approved, 12 weeks if you don't have cirrhosis, 24 weeks if you do. Again, all oral therapy. This is gonna be the one that's gonna be coming out within the next one to three weeks. These are the AbbVie products, the so-called 3D. And what we'll focus on just real quickly, with or without ribavirin, this was um, 12 weeks of therapy in the non serotics here, 98 to 100% cure rates. So pretty hard to beat that. If you take a look at just the serotics, you actually still find amazingly good response rates. I have no idea how these are gonna come out because again, until the FDA approves, we don't know, but presumably 12 weeks is what it's looking like. Now, for those of us old enough in the audience to remember the game show Name That Tune, we play the game of, if you can treat it in 12 weeks, why not eight weeks, seven weeks, six weeks? And so there was a study by Merck that came out that suggested one week of therapy was all you needed. And then there was the four week therapy. Well, suffice it to say, that sounds really cool, but the four week therapy just didn't really uh, hold it there. So at least for the moment, probably eight weeks is gonna be the minimum for very low viral loads. 12 weeks will be kind of your average. Now, what about the safety in these patients? I mean, obviously, these drugs are great. They work, but if they're killing half the people off or they're making people so sick, not a great compromise. So what I did was I actually took some of the worst of the worst. These are only cirrhotic patients. And I put the red bar here. These are patients that had to stop their drugs due to adverse events, essentially none of them. The only side effects in these oral drugs that actually came up as being significant, fatigue, and headache. I can live with that, they can live with that for 12 weeks compared to interferon. So that's all genotype one, because that's been the nightmare, the one that's fought us so hard. And um, genotype two, as I said, very easy to treat. The one that's actually gonna still be a problem, interestingly, is genotype three. This is a series of different studies put together, and what you find here is circled are the genotype three patients with cirrhosis. These are different regimens, but 60 to 70-ish percent cure rates, but if they had failed previous therapy, still somewhere in that 70-ish percent rate. So genotype three is gonna be a little bit trickier to try and treat. A couple studies at uh, the most recent meetings that looked at purely oral therapies, and what they found were pretty good numbers for genotype three, 90-ish percent. But buried deep down in the abstract was that if you had genotype three with cirrhosis and you tried this oral therapy, still 60%. So even though I was kind of referred to as interferon and ribavirin or on life support and barely hanging on, there may still be a place for interferon in genotype three. Now, for our HIV colleagues, HIV and hep C is difficult, and it was very difficult in the interferon era, mostly because patients with HIV could not tolerate the interferon rule well. So here, in the current era with these direct-acting antivirals, it turns out that HIV and hep C co-infection is essentially the same as hep C. The only kicker, you have to be careful of your drug-drug interactions. Outside of that, these are pretty impressive. So SVR12s, 97%, so really no different whether they were infected or not. So in terms of conclusions, you know, I'll bring up a few thoughts here. Number one, birth cohort screening. And again, now that we have such good therapies, I think there's a good reason to do it. 1945 to 1965, again, don't ignore people before, after, or with extra risk factors. Feel free to screen them, but at least get this group done. We talked about this SVR, again, complete therapy with whatever, get them off therapy and 12 and 24 weeks later, if they're negative, they're cured or they're a sustained virologic responder. We've seen significant benefits. Again, I don't promise reversal of cirrhosis, though it has been well documented in the literature. To me, if you are cirrhotic before I cure you, I'm still gonna screen you for varices and cancer. 
In terms of therapies, massive improvements, very quick, very quick improvements. Again, we've tagged along with our HIV colleagues and learned a lot. Also, the FDA of 2014 is very different than the old FDA. They're approving drugs much faster than they used to, for better or for worse, but they are doing it. And as I said, unfortunately, interferon ribavirus still are lingering into life support. Now, I don't know what the future is going to be here, but I expect that somebody will come up with a six-week regimen, maybe a four-week regimen. But believe me, for the patients that we have on these 8 and 12 and 24, the side effects are pretty much nil. And so really, it would be more compliance issues for the patient, convenience for the patient, and hopefully cost. Though I might argue that if a new regimen comes out at four weeks, they'll probably charge you double or triple because the drug company will want to get their money back. Now, there's still some groups. Serotics, I showed you that serotics have good response rates, but most of those studies were not severely decompensated serotics, so the pre-transplant patients. Again, I didn't show it to you. There's pretty good data on them as well. HIV co-infection, again, we still have some work to do, especially with the drug-drug interactions. Liver transplant recipients, we're getting very comfortable. We're starting a lot of patients on therapy. The one group that I do not have any good therapy for for right now is the renal failure group. Cefospivir is not approved in people with a GFR under 30 or end-stage renal disease. And if you'll notice, most of those regimens, at least the two that are approved at this moment, both contain cefospivir. A lot of studies going on, but this is a very frustrating group to us because right now what we're doing is telling them to get their kidney and we'll treat them afterward. The kidney waiting list is five to seven years, so it's not like they have a quick and easy way to do that. And then finally, with the ridiculous cost of these medicines ranging from 60 up to um, $308,000 for the course, there's obviously going to be some access to care cost issues. So again, just to reiterate, we've made some major progress, and so hepatitis C really could be something that we, I'll say, semi-obliterate soon. I mean, obviously, it's not going to be that easy, but the point is we've made amazing progress here. And so at that point, I'll actually end on time with a few minutes for questions. Thanks uh, very much, Marty. A lot of uh, very important things happening. Yeah. Dr. Cohen, thank you so much. I just had a question about uh, genotypes during the treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, treatment. So in HIV, especially in people who are non-compliant, sometimes we have to redo genotypes. You can get well type, and that affects management. This is obviously a difference because it's a shorter course, and I just wondered if there's implications for that. Also, in the same vein, do you have issues with people who have been cured? and then reinfection if they stay within the same area for risk factors and yeah. implications that has to be there. So in terms of genotypes, we don't care about it because we actually don't see changes. We don't go from wild type to something else. So for us, you either have it and you're that genotype or you don't have it. So that's not an issue. Now in terms of the other, we could spend a long time talking about that. Um, first thing I do is I do require abstinence from whatever it is, alcohol, drugs, etc. Now I usually do a three to four months and I'm just making that up. That's just kind of what I standardly do. It's really got to be a commitment because I'm worried about resistance, I'm worried about cost obviously, and the last thing I want to do is give them the drug and three weeks later they stop and now have we set them up for resistance. There's also a little financial kicker. We, we do not know what is real and what is just rumors, but the rumor is that you will be given hepatitis C treatment by the government, aka your insurance, Medicare, whatever, one time. If you screw it up, that is it. Now, obviously, it's going to be tough in a court of law to do that, but the point is I do talk to the patients about that because I have a lot, I see a um, huge number of these patients with Dr. Chen in the uh, Suboxone Clinic. And, you know, a lot of these people, and, you know, no surprise anyone here, if you watch them, they're clean, they relapse, they're clean, they're, you know, and so I really need to get some uh, long-term sobriety from them. We're going to get burned sometimes. Now, in terms of treatment and cure and reinfection, it doesn't matter technically because uh, you're starting over. Be it their own infection that came back, they relapsed, or be it a new one, it doesn't matter. You would start back with therapy. We do not think that there is resistance from these hep C drugs. That is the theory. These are, they're not archived mutations. 
that waits to be seen. Because again, even though Hep B and HIV are a different type of virus than Hep C, I still want to actually get that proven. So long-winded answer, they need to prove to me that they're going to be compliant with this. Should healthcare workers uh, be screened? Um, most I, I know <laughs> personally of two physicians who, uh, you know, had hepatitis C were unaware uh, of it, incidentally discovered. That, that's a very difficult question. In Europe, the answer is no before, and I'll tell you the reason why, because you would not be allowed to work. Mm -hmm. And so um, the O'Shea criteria is actually quite nasty, and if you look at it, if you have active Hep B, you cannot do anything where you have potential blood-to-blood -blood contact. Uh, that which includes something as simple as putting in IVs, lines, etc., all the way up to surgery. Um, same thing with hepatitis C. So in Europe, people were very hesitant to do it. Well, now with Hep C therapy, yes. it's essentially going to be able to cure everybody. Then the answer is yes. It's not a standard screening recommendation. However, you know, if you look across the board, many people will fall into 1945 to 1965. Yeah. But for our residents and fellows, it is not currently a screening guideline. I sure don't think it's a bad idea, but in the absence of risk factors like needle sticks, etc., there is no recommendation to do it. Keith? The prognosis in healthcare workers who do get it from is it was pretty good. The majority clear it out there, but that, that well, I don't know if I'd say the majority. I'd, you know, it's still technically that 15 to 30 percent. And uh, but having said that, you know, you start your clock at zero. And so the point is that you know when we see a 40-year-old may have had it for 20 years, when we see a 40-year-old who got stuck yesterday, you know, it's going to be pretty short. So I'm not so worried about them because we'll be, you know, we used to use the uh, interferon ribavirin right up front, and we could actually cure. That's the numbers. You know, we could cure 70 to 90 percent of them. Them. Now with the oral therapy, I'd, I'd let them declare themselves, and if they're one of the 70-ish percent that goes on to chronic, we'll treat them and cure them in a couple months. Other comments or questions? If not, thank you very much. Thank you.